the meeting. Karen, come on. <laughs> we have a full meeting ahead of us, and the uh, so it'd be good to start as promptly as as we can. Um, so this uh, meeting is a a regular planning meeting of the Planning and the Zoning Commission. Um, David Colbert. Uh, we have members Anna Tamel, um, Jill Cutler, Steve Sicardi, and alternates Ben Gray Jr. and Ginny Potter. Um, Before we um, get into the meeting proper, I'd like to just um, mention the passing of Peter Kalmas, who was a regular member until about a week ago. And uh, Peter was a very loyal planning and zoning member, and uh, he will be missed. Um, having said that, um, the overview of today's meeting is we're going to hear a few remarks from our planning consultant for the new town plan, Jocelyn Ayers, who's also um, a planner with the Northwest Hills Council of Governments. But in this capacity for us, she's our consulting planner in this town plan. After Jocelyn, I will give some remarks about the work of the Planning and Zoning Commission in the past um, year. And then each of our subcommittees will have a very brief presentation. And then whoever is representing one of the groups who wants to make uh, working to help Cornwall, who wants to make a brief presentation, will also be invited to do so. There will be uh, questions. I'll try to keep the question period to be at the end of all of the presentations. And um, there are uh, uh, there are refreshments in back. Coffee will be available from shortly. And having said that, and here's Phil West, also an alternate. Um, Jocelyn. Sure. Um, good morning. It's an exciting morning, right? Um, so thank you all for, for being here. Uh, and uh, one of the things that the Planning and Zoning Commission is hoping to uh, get from you all this morning, uh, as you know, they're in the process of updating your town plan of conservation and development. So getting your thoughts and input about um, basically how do you, what do you want to see happen in Cornwall over the next 10 years? What do you want to change? What do you want to stay the same? Um, to, that, uh, to that end, as you might have seen when you came in, there are some questions on the boards. One of them is what do you want to change and what do you want to stay the same over the next 10 years? If you have thoughts on that um, while you're sitting here or after the forum, please jot them down on the sticky notes. If you didn't get any, there's lots of sticky notes on the table on the way in, and you can go stick them out there anytime. There's a couple other questions out there, including um, what could Cornwall do to attract and retain its young, young people and young residents and young families? 
Um, and the other question is, if you're a member of a, another town board, commission, or organization, are there ways that you could collaborate with other organizations or um, either in the region or in the town in order to better meet your goals um, and the town's goals as a whole? So those are three questions. If you have ideas on them, you can drop them down on your sticky notes anytime. And there'll be some time at the end of the forum for you to put them on or you can put them on as you go out. Um, in addition, um, there is uh, resident input survey that is online that will be available as of today to fill out. There is going to be an insert in your next Cornwall Chronicle, so you can look for it. And that asks a series of questions that will hopefully only take you about nine minutes to fill out. Um, but we really, again, need your input on you know what you want to see um, happen in Cornwall over the next eight, ten years. Um, and I think that's. That's it. Um, so thanks for being here. Okay. Um, so first, the um, the the remarks just to bring you up to date on the work of the Planning and Zoning Commission in the past year. There's not too much to say because most of our work has been involved in this process, which we're all here today for. The other item I ought to, uh, ought to mention is the uh, revision to our agricultural regulations, which has had uh, many uh, twists and turns over the past couple years. It is likely to go to a public hearing. It had, it had a previous public hearing that we gathered input and it's it's likely to go to a public hearing that we hope will be the <coughs> hearing that will approve it in March. So that's just um, a heads up. Um, okay, so um, now is the uh, time for each of the um, subcommittees to uh, make their brief updates as to the work that they've been doing. On our agenda, it mentions five, but there's actually four subcommittees. There's a merger happened, so there'll first be housing, and then economic development, and then um, natural resources, and then community resources, and um, young families combined. So, Housing, Joe. Good morning. Uh, I'm Joe Cutler, and I am the chair of the housing subcommittee, which consists of Ginny Block, Lisa Lansing, Jackie Schiller, George Wolf, Joanne Wojtacek, and um, I'd also like to thank Karen Nelson our land use officer, for Selectman Gordon Ridgway, who's come faithfully to our meetings and driven us to some site visits, and Jocelyn Ayer. Um, <clears throat> I think we all know that Cornwall has a kind of crisis, and it is one that's very common in rural America, in the small towns of rural America, but I'll give you a couple of statistics that will sort of thicken the picture for you. Our school age population is projected to decline 31% between 2020 and 2030. And our population of older people, 65 and older, is projected to increase by 11% in that period. We now have the highest vacancy rate of any town in the northwest corner. And what that means is over 40% of our homes are owned by people who don't live in Cornwall full time. We desperately need young people and young families because we need to fill our school. We need volunteers for our fire department and ambulance corps. Our town is run by volunteers, 
and the volunteers who are running the town are getting older. We need young people. And it is the opinion of the Housing Committee that we don't, at this point, have housing stock that's suitable for young people with not much money. Um, our homes are expensive. They are older homes that are not suitable for today's tastes in houses. They're large. They, many of them have more than three bedrooms. And they are expensive to heat and take care of. Uh, so we need new housing strategies, and that was pretty clear to all of us. We like to create new zoning regulations for multi-unit rental dwellings, perhaps built by private developers, which would be a big change for us. Um, <clears throat> we could reduce our standard lot sizes, which are the largest in northwestern Connecticut. Our lot sizes are basically three and five acres. Uh, we could encourage the conversion of larger old homes into multi-unit dwellings for rental or as condos. Uh, some older people have expressed a desire to uh, move into a condo because they don't wish to maintain a large house, but they would still like to stay in Cornwall, and they're not people who could qualify for affordable housing. Um, we want to explore the construction of workplace or seasonal housing. Um, we like to support, if we possibly can, the construction of community septic and wells. We noted that Norfolk, which has some very nice, affordable units that they've built, have been able to build such units because they have water and septic. And so the builders don't have that expense going into it. Uh, we think that we should, as a town, establish a community-funded down payment program. And we'd like to help older people <coughs> or people with older homes make them energy efficient. And that might be with the town fund as well. Um, these, this is just an overview of the things that we're looking at and the things that we're going to recommend. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, economic development, <coughs> Anna. Hi, I'm Anna Tamell, and uh, with James Laporta, who is out of town right now, I co-chaired the Subcommittee for Economic Development. We had eight regular members. Gordon Richway and Karen Nelson as ex officio members. I don't understand how our first selectman manages it personally to attend all of our meetings and contribute the way he does. I've got a clone somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, at any rate, we've had five meetings to date. There's another one scheduled for Monday night. Um, Jill has stolen my thunder a little bit in talking about the, the various disturbing forecasts for Cornwall. You're, if you look on the Cornwall website, uh, which also <coughs> is a volunteer organization, um, you will find a document called Cornwall by the Numbers, which summarizes some of the demographic data that we have available to us through the U.S. Census Bureau and some other sources. And it is because of the projections of that data that the Economic Development Subcommittee felt a very powerful sense of urgency. This uh, town, as most of you know, has lost businesses in the last few years. We could name a few. I was speaking to John Calhoun the other day, who grew up here in the 1950s. He told me that there were 21 working dairy farms when he was a young man working out. The town has changed dramatically and um, not necessarily in a way that ke would keep us economically viable and, and vibrant. Oh, we feel that in order to attract the diverse population that includes more young families, 
we also have to provide better economic opportunities here in town. Uh, one of the things that's quite unique about Cornwall is that we have a very high percentage of people who uh, work from home. We also have a very high percentage of people who are self-employed and work from their homes. Um, in fact, this, these are the highest numbers uh, anywhere in Litchfield County. Uh, and even uh, certainly in the state of Connecticut. You'll find all the exact numbers on the website in the uh, data by the numbers document or the Cornwall by the numbers document. So one of the recommendations of the Economic Development Subcommittee was that we need to make it easier for people to work from home. We want to be sure that our zoning regula regulations don't put obstacles in their way. The other uh, general recommendations uh, include the goal of expanding the commercial zones in Cornwall, providing more areas, especially along state highways, where people could start a business. Um, we want to do whatever we need to do within the zoning regulations to make um, sensible economic activity possible. Perhaps Cornwall could look at trying to attract some light manufacturing. Our economic life in America has changed drastically in the last 20 years. Light manufacturing no longer means huge brick monoliths with black smoke emerging from chimneys. We're using 3D printers. We're using technology to make, to make manufacturing more energy efficient and um, less visible. So I think there's a lot that we can do here in Cornwall to uh, modernize and bring the 21st century into town so that our young folks don't leave home and or come on back after they've seen the world for a bit. We need them to take care of us as we get older and uh, we need them to keep our lawns mowed, we need them to uh, go into the trades so we can call a local electrician or a local plumber and uh, there are more specific recommendations from the Economic Subcommittee. I'm not going to torture you with all of them. You will find a lot of them in the survey, which will be online this, this evening, by this evening, I'm told. I'm looking at Karen and hoping she's gonna get the link up. Get the link up and you will have a chance to vote. Which is, and I would like you to encourage all of your Cornwall neighbors and friends, send them all emails, Sit, put a notice on Facebook, m make a phone call. The more input this town gets, the more we'll get a feel for what people want on the one hand or can be convinced of on the other. So thank you. Thank you. So now I'll speak on behalf of the Natural Resources Subcommittee. First, I'd like to echo <coughs> something Anna just said about the survey. Maybe you'll hear this numerous times this morning. The easiest way to fill out the survey is going to be online and we're going to send out an email to all the groups in Cornwall that has a link to the survey and we will hope that these groups will send it to their entire list. Um, we, are, we don't have a very extensive list ourselves of emails in Cornwall, but if all the groups do so to their lists, that will help a great deal. Um, David, excuse me, are you encouraging weekenders to fill that out too? Or? Yes, every okay. single homeowner in Cornwall. Um, Okay, so uh, now for the, the Natural Resources Subcommittee. There are five members, uh, myself, uh, Debbie Bennett, Katie Frygang, Margie Parnell, and Hector Prudhomme. We have met seven times and have uh, generated a list of topics we are uh, uh, considering addressing in the town plan. These include uh, ridgeline uh, protection, low impact, 
development regulations, um, climate um, resilience, and more, which also is on the website. Um, beyond our specific items, we feel the work of all the subcommittees are intertwined, and we all complement each other as we strive to make Cornwall a stronger, a more vibrant community. Um, we are fully aware, as Jill mentioned, of the need Cornwall has to increase our housing options. To that end, we uh, created a map that um, shows the land use um, constraints for or the land use of factors that involve um, septic. So um, where in Cornwall is septic more feasible for increased um, density? This um, map is a work in progress. It's, it's available to look at. It's still a draft map, but we're told it has been of some help to the housing subcommittee and and we hope that is the case. Um, um, uh, also, uh, uh, related to increasing the housing options, as Anna spoke, as the need and Jill spoke, we're all going to speak about the need to attract families that have young children. Um, and as Anna spoke, we have so much, such a high percentage of, of, of self-employed here in Cornwall. This is a group that can uh, choose to live in Cornwall. Many of this group are able to choose where they live. It's not based on an existing job. Often they're able to create their own jobs, work from home. So the Natural Resources Subcommittee feels that part of the, the major considerations in attracting this group is our natural um, resources. Um, I think we're probably, many of us, we, it's not too hard to agree on that people choose to live here to some large extent because of the quality, the beauty of our, our, our natural resources. We think this will be true of the young families who might choose to move here as well. Um, so our feeling is that of the, uh, the most likely uh, uh, potential for increasing our economic um, resources in today's kind of economy, the most bang for the buck is going to come from um, altering and reconsidering our home-based uh, business regulations and bringing in technologies such as um, uh, fiber optic. Uh, that is a technology that every week I'm hearing how important, how much, how important that is in attracting businesses. That's a um, technology that can can make a huge difference for Cornwall um, without altering our the qualities that attract and bring people into Cornwall. Um, in in uh, uh, conclusion, we will be putting forth proposals that we feel sh uh, ought to be a win-win situation for Cornwall. A more protected uh, natural environment that will play the strong role it has, it has played and play an increasingly strong role in attracting um, young, vibrant uh, community. Thank you. And, and now Jim will speak on behalf of the both the community resources, well, the, the merged community resources and uh, young families subcommittees.
Hi, my name is Ben Gray Jr. So the reason why we merged these two subcommittees was strictly to get a um, stronger result. Uh, I'm just going to re read a prepared statement I have here. So um, I'm a co-chair. Uh, some of my other co-chairs, we've got Steve Sicardi here, Jimmy Potter, Phil West. Uh, other members include Iris Herman, Kale Williamson, and Dean Sicardi. Um, so far we've held two meetings, more to follow. Um, we're kind of just getting together now, so I'm not going to give you as many results as these individuals have spoken about. So with Cornwall experiencing a declining population and increasingly large proportion of individuals over the age of 60, the goal of this subcommittee was twofold. To assess the status of community and cultural resources as outlined in the 2010 POCD, Plan of Conservation and Development, as well as pay particular attention to the specific needs of younger individuals. Drawing on the perspectives of subcommittee members from across all age groups, we're in the process of examining and updating, where necessary, the following specific areas as outlined in the 2010 POCD. Setting specific goals for each area, we will be proposing strategies geared at meeting these goals, with particular attention paid towards retaining and increasing numbers of younger persons in Cornwall. Some su such possible examples are as follows. So these are the areas that we're going to be looking at. Um, uh, volunteering in town, recreation, social services, infrastructure, education, and communication. And like I said, we're going to be paying particular attention to uh, uh, youth, retaining and attracting youth. Um, I'm not going to give you examples right now, uh, or many examples. I'll give one. We, you know, we've been talking about the need for uh, more EMS volunteers, emergency medical services, firemen, EMTs, um, so possibly some sort of housing initiative. Uh, it, we've got other ideas, but just for time constraints, I'm going to let it go at that. But anyway, this is an ongoing process. Thank you. <coughs> now we have a very uh, long list of, of uh, potential groups to speak. <laughs> I'm trying to go in alphabetical order again, and I, I'm hoping <coughs> that each group will speak for a, a maximum of uh, three uh, minutes. If I've uh, missed a group, um, please raise your hand either during the alphabetical process or at the end of it. So first, uh, yeah, yeah. So first, uh, we would like the board of selectmen to see if, if they have any <coughs> any statement to make. Sure. Thank you, David. And these haven't been approved by anybody, so I'll take full responsibility. But our board, a very unified board, and appreciates the work this commission is doing to meet our current challenges uh, and uh, I have some prepared uh, remarks and thank everybody for coming here and to see such a great turnout uh, gives me uh, great confidence in the future of the town as we work ahead on a plan to look at both the conservation and development opportunities uh, for the town as part of this planning process uh, but just to make it a little exciting I'll go off uh, I'll go off uh, script. We know how exciting that can be when our political leaders go off script. So I'll say a few things about, about the, uh, the the current or the the previous shutdown and, and and how that affected the town. And there is a point to all this. So as we know, the federal government was shut down and luckily it's reopened. But I think it brought home to me in the last week or two how important this town is to its residents because this town cannot shut down. There are things the town does for people, whether it's food security, social services, uh, working. We had this conference call with our recently elected officials, federal and state, to help farmers out who were struggling to get loans. So when things, when other things shut down, it's the local governments that really provide those services. And Harry Truman said, "The buck stops here," was his uh, slogan. I learned what that meant when I was called first when I was first became first select when somebody had a dead deer on the side of the road. So there's no one else. <laughs> and sorry for the graphic, but, um, and Harry had a better idea than that. But there are things that the buck stops here. And again, to make the point that there's things that we do that are really important. Um, 
And now back to the script. And to be here in this um, hub of Cornwall activity, the school, the fire department, child center up the road, and Little Guild. Louder, Gordon, please. Louder, louder, Clear. okay. Here we go. <laughs> I'll give you louder, I can't give you clearer. Um, <laughs> to be here in this hub of Cornwall activity, the school, the fire department, the child center, and Little Guild shows how our town cannot shut down. Our kids need nurturing and an education. Cornwall emergencies <coughs> need a response uh, team ready 24 hours each day, 365 days a year. Um, animals and people need our civic organizations to enhance their quality of life. There is no one else to do this work. No county, state, federal employee or workers. Just us, the citizens of Cornwall, to sustain uh, our town. I would encourage everyone to look at the current demographic information compiled by Anna Tamel, showing Cornwall's recent population decline increasing housing vacancy and aging population, which are trends that are also happening in other nearby towns. So I guess my message today is we need more Cornwall residents. In, in, uh, in the past year, young families have helped increase the enrollment at this school, which is positively good news. There are real opportunities for meaningful change in a small place. Just as a population decline of 100 residents hits a town of 1,400 harder than a community of 14,000, an enrollment increase of 15 students in a school of 75 students is much more significant than the school of 750. There are plenty of locally grown initiatives right now underway in Cornwall to reboot Cornwall's economy into the 21st century. Work is being done. Um, on a realistic sewer proposal for West Cornwall. Another group is working to improve internet connectivity in the area. People and businesses are looking to relocate here. Young families are looking to relocate here. So the question is, is there, is there room for here in Cornwall, the most sparsely populated town in the state? I hope the answer is yes. Cornwall residents, both part-time and full-time, are, are meeting this weekend to work on plans to revitalize the former Torrington-Yukon uh, campus as a regional center for the arts. Another group is working on um, trying to bring a brew pub to Cornwall. We need to encourage these types of innovative proposals. One of the unifying characteristics of people <coughs> in Cornwall is our fondness of scratching the rocky soil here and growing things. As winter yields to spring, we must be sure that, Corn that the Cornwall Garden is ready for a new season of growth. Thank you. Nice, Martin. <laughs> okay. Now, um, uh, from Board of Ed, is anyone here for? Okay. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Catherine Taggi. I'm the chairman of the Board of Education. Uh, and our board members are Emily Pryor, Dave Cadwell, Catherine Holsterman, Tracy Gray, Marina Kachibu, Kachibu, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce her name, and John Sanders is our representative to the uh, high school. Uh, I'm going to read quickly a statement. Uh, the purpose of the Board of Education is to ensure the provision of a quality education for the children of Cornwall. Last year, the Board held a series of community conversations about the future of educating Cornwall children. These discussions were wide-ranging and considered many options, including extreme measure of closing the school in the event of long-term enrollment projections, which are quite dire if they come to pass. Overall, however, those who participated in these conversations seemed to see the school as a central part of our town and concluded that the best course of action was to maintain a CCS as a comprehensive K-8 to school and to work hard to make it an even more high-quality, attractive school that can contribute to development and progress in Cornwall. With that context, our primary concern as it relates to this work is the number of school-aged children in Cornwall and the related factors of affordable housing and economic development. 
we know that these are complex issues with complicated relationships with many other issues, but they are the ones that matter to the work of the Board of Education and the school. Um, if you want to know what our strategic plan is, we have online, we have a, the Cornwall Consolidated School Strategic School Improvement Plan, which you can access and see more details. Um, so that's what I have to say about education. I do want to bring up something very important to this town that came to my attention, and I'm not sure all of you are aware of, but the Little Guild has uh, the board and the staff have determined that they need to expand, that the facility is not up to par, they do not have the things needed to deal with the number of animals that are being, uh, in, that need to be rescued. And um, so the space that they have right now does not work. They cannot expand on the current site. So they are going to be moving. And it is in our interest to try to find a way to keep them in Cornwall. This was born in Cornwall, and we want to be sure that the Little Guild stays in Cornwall. So we are looking, they are looking for um, five to seven acres of land, at least one acre that is flat, that can, they can build a new facilities. And they would like to make it so that it's state of the art and they will have it sort of for another 50 years and can potentially expand. But with climate change and all that, they're seeing more and more animals that are being, that need to be cared for. So I uh, just- commercially zoned? It, uh, does it need to be commercially zoned? Uh, Gordon? Uh, I'm not sure, but... Um, anyway, I, I don't want to take yeah. I just wanted to let you all know, because I'm not sure everyone knows about it. Thank that's, you. That's a great heads up, and because that was basically um, two, okay. you know, two, um, two, reports. two reports, it stayed under our um, six minutes. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> three for each. Is, um, is there anyone here for the Agricultural uh, Commission? I would simply like to speak on behalf of Bill Deneen. I spoke to him last night. Um, he did not... Stand up. I spoke to Bill Deneen last night. He did not prepare a report, but he did want me to convey the fact to you that he's very pleased with all the work that you're doing on your agricultural regulations, and he's very proud to be in a town in which he has such great volunteers as all of you are on the board and you are to be commended for your work. That's his report. Great. Uh, Cornwall Association? Hello. I'm Priscilla Pavel, president of the Cornwall Association. I think of us as a booster group for Cornwall. We are more social than anything else. And we do important things, like when the town was 275 years old, we had a flag contest. And a local person designed that wonderful flag. There's one flying out front, and there's one uh, in the center of town across the street from the town hall. This year, we're going to have a trivia night for the first time. We're always open to ideas, um, and that's us. We're cheerleaders. Thank you. <laughs> special applause because that was under a minute. That's a high bar. To, that's a very high bar. Uh, it, it wasn't her, her practice of Tai Chi. That would have gone the other way. Um, you forgot to mention the video camera. The, uh, the Cornwall Association owns a video camera that does all oh. And I forgot to mention also, okay, since I've got to go over my minute. They are having a big program. Um, oh no, that's that's not me, that's the that's the friend. Sorry, I'm wrong. <laughs> but we do own the, we did provide with monies from the Cornwall Foundation. Uh, I, that's another thing that we well, are a five oh one C and so we are able to filter um, funds from into uh, for profit because they can be given to us as a non-profit and that was how we were able to do that I believe. The video camera. The video camera, right. yes. And Richard donates his time, a lot of it. So the, 
The um, a anyone want to speak for the Cornwall Conservation Commission? Okay. Hi, I'm Debbie Bennett, and I'm speaking for Pat Mulberry, who some of you know our great leader is laid up with uh, meat and ladder. Yeah. Um, Pat has been uh, suffered an injury and a fall on the ice, so he can't be here, so I'm going to read a prepared statement. The Conservation Commission currently is dedicating its energies toward updating Cornwall's Natural Resource Inventory, NRI, the document first compiled in 2007. The updated NRI will serve as a guide to the many natural and a few select cultural resources that define Cornwall. Topics such as the geology underlying our land, critical wildlife habitats, varied water resources, open spaces, farms, and forests, as well as important historic and cultural aspects of the town will be described. Their relationships and relevance to the life of the town will be summarized and recommendations will be made all to preserve Cornwall's rural character for generations to come. As you know, the goals of rural character, sense of place, and preservation of natural resources important to recreational-based economy were ranked as high priority in the last POCD. The effort has three overarching goals, to identify unique places and key features of our town that merit preservation, to describe the natural resources found in Cornwall, including discussion of the larger regional context, and the important associations between natural resources, our continued well-being, and ecosystem health. To educate town residents and officials regarding the various options available to enhance Cornwall's rural character by helping to guide intelligent conservation, preservation, and development. Soon, the Commission hopes to host neighborhood forums and these will elicit vital local information and opinions. Members of the Commission are also working with the Planning and Zoning Commission to assist with the update of the town's plan of conservation and development in conjunction with the Commission's efforts to identify areas appropriate for protection. Our efforts will also help to identify areas suitable for appropriate development. Thank you. Respectfully, Pat Mulberry. Thanks, Debbie. Now, anyone from the Cornwall Conservation Trust. I'm Bart Jones. I'm chair of the board of the Cornwall Conservation Trust. And I want to say three things. Remind you of what our mission is, talk about a couple of accomplishments that we've had this year, and talk about what we view for the future. Let me just remind you of what our mission is, and it's in our five-year strategic plan, which goes from 2016 to 2021. I recommend you take a look at it on the website. Um, Cornwall Conservation Trust's mission is to conserve open space lands in Cornwall and adjacent towns, and to manage those lands to promote wildlife habitat, forest improvement, water quality, farming, and public recreation. So three accomplishments this year, two relating to conservation of land, one relating to farm. We have raised $410,000 to preserve about 60 acres on the side of our iconic Teradiddle Mountain. Uh, that should close when the U.S. government reopens. <laughs> uh, we have some federal money for that. The second thing is, uh, Buddy Fletcher, who owns a 1,000 acres in Cornwall, as you know, has gone bankrupt. And so there are going to be a 1,000 acres in Cornwall, including the castle, which, of course, we'd like to make our headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we have preserved 100 acres alongside Furnace Brook. It uh, used to be part of, actually, the farm that I uh, have part of the Jim Gotchen property. That's uh, we've gotten a state grant for 403,000 towards a purchase price of 622,000. That will provide public access to Weontonoc State Forest and improve the recreation okay. capabilities in town, and also have a field which can be farmed. The other accomplishment is our Farm Cornwall uh, program. 
And that, uh, as you know, had an opportunity to focus on farming in Cornwall and talk about ways in which we can support our farmers. We like to think that that's a future for youth in Cornwall. That goes to what we want to do in the future. Um, you remember two years ago, we had a seminar, basically, I'll call it green to gold. How can we be green and economically vital at the same time? We will be working on ways for a both and proposition. We will stay green and we will be economically vital. One way of doing that is green jobs. The Cornwall Conservation Trust employs five people, admittedly part-time, but two of them live in Cornwall. I'd like to point out also that HBA is a <coughs> conservation organization in Cornwall and employs 12 people. So there's an opportunity for green to gold jobs. The other thing we'd like to do is to promote smart growth, uh, not just sprawl. And we're hoping that working together, uh, we can do that in Cornwall. Uh, I just want to make one comment about demographics. I was on a committee in New York for a grammar school in 1983, and we hired a very expensive demographic firm to predict the future of New York City and whether we should have a high school. Well, they came back with a report, very expensive, said, New York City is only going to get older and grayer. There will be no children in New York City. <laughs> well, guess what? They were totally wrong. The other thing, historically, the peak population in Cornwall was 1850. There were 2,500 people here. The lowest point was in the 1930s. It got down to 600. And I'll remind you, in 1950, there were only 900 people here. So I would say, yes, it's a concern. But think of the World War II English phrase, keep calm and carry on. <laughs> this is not a crisis. It is urgent. But keep calm and carry on. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. But it was worth it. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, anyone for the Economic Development Commission? Yeah, probably somebody. <laughs> How about me? Okay. Good morning, people. Uh, Janet Carlson, I chaired the Economic Development Commission. Um, I'm one of ten on that committee. Todd, Priscilla, Gordon, Richard, Kate. Can hear you. Jesus, Joseph, Mary, move up, woman. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't hear me, there's something wrong. Uh, Jackie, Simon, and Bianca. So in uh, 2018, we actually did get a lot of stuff done. Um, social media campaign for Cornwall Consolidated was launched. When you raise a flag, people come. So, um, let's see, we increased the population 27%. And it's actually probably more than that because two new kids came last week. So, when you raise a flag, you know, people know, here, you know here's the place to be. And I'll talk more about some of that stuff later. And if somebody in the expensive seats can't hear me, let me know that. <laughs> okay. Um, we revamped the school website. I have some visuals, sorry. Get in your way. I'm not going to stay, like, to the exact time, Big Ben, so... I'll, I'll do the best I can. Uh-oh. Oh, I know. No, it'll be worth it. Trust me. All right. School website. You probably can't see that, but it's just, um, I wanted to bring a couple of visuals. So the school website needed to be redone. It got redone. Um, we redid the Explore Cornwall site. We did that in conjunction with Civic Lift. So that is now more event-driven and a little bit more dynamic. It's still a work in progress. Bear with us. Social media campaign for the school. Nice and simple and graphic. We had three different um, campaigns that we ran. We ran them down in New York. We ran them in Connecticut. Um, the, the impressions we got were crazy. I mean, it was, I think we had over 200,000 views of our ads in New York City. So you know, I just read some information about people looking to move up into New York. 
They're worried about global warming, rightfully so. I lived in Red Hook, Brooklyn. We flooded our house three times. Every time it rained hard, we worried. So people who live in Red Hook, Brooklyn, which is a crap ton of people, by the way, if, you know, if 10 of them move here, we're golden. So, <laughs> all we have to do is flood Brooklyn a little bit. Um, we launched the informational tour, uh, the tourist kiosks. Dick was a big part of that. So if you see those down by the river and at the Colonial Country Market, you can thank Dick Sears because he was right on top of that. Um, for 2019, we're going to be creating a social media campaign to bring businesses here. We talk a lot about young people. I mean, now young people is under 50, so that shouldn't be too tough to do. Um, our theme is going to be a bridge between life and work. Um, I want to point out, Jackie Schiller has been a godsend on work on stuff. Jackie is right there. She's awesome. Um, you know, we can you know, think of ideas. We've both worked in advertising, so it's right in our wheelhouse to do. Um, we're also, thanks to Catherine and Dominique, working with the Hodgkiss kids. So uh, they have brought the kids together, um, working on a bunch of different stuff with uh, Civic Life. If you don't know Civic Life, give them a lot of money. They're wonderful people <laughs> doing wonderful stuff. Um, the Hodgkiss kids are going to be working with us on this campaign. So we're getting bodies. We're getting some money towards that. So they're going to match our budget on that. So we've now doubled our money. Um, and we're going to be working on social media, you know, getting that word out. The other thing is it provides a PR opportunity. Anything Hotchkiss is doing, people want to hear about too. So that you know, just provides a little bit more ammo for us. Um, we won the grant for the creation of a pop-up hub. So we'll be doing a community workspace in the pottery building, or former pottery building. Um, Dean Scardi has very generously agreed to be our intern for that. Um, that's going to launch in the spring. We're also looking at launching an internship uh, program for businesses in Cornwall. Um, both the high school and Northwest Community College are working with the EC on that. Um, we've actually been doing some pilot programs that were absolutely brilliant. So, you know, the businesses need inexpensive labor and to get some experience. Dean was actually a part of that. He was a rock star at 111. We just adored working with him. And he can channel a uh, you know, middle-aged white woman like nobody's business. <laughs> we had a, we had working on a spa campaign, and it was just brilliant. So, um, at least five buildings in West Cornwall are in play right now. So business plans are being written. People are looking. So I know everybody's freaking out because there's some dark buildings in West Cornwall. Relax already. Things are going to happen. Um, you know, like I'm. I, I know I'm a glasses half full kind of girl, but you know, like I. You know, I also don't want to hear the constant theme of the Debbie Downer and the wah, wah, wah. It's just not like that. I mean, things have to die for other things to grow. When we spread enough stuff in West Cornwall that things can certainly grow. So, you know, I don't want to be on tape cursing because my husband will talk about that for next week. Um, lots of media opportunities. You know, the New Yorkers are looking to escape to the country or see woods or cows or something. And all we have to do is point out the fact that we're here. You know, Hudson's much more expensive. It's getting much more crowded. We got a lot less hipsters, so they can be the cool guys in town. Anyway, that's what's happening with EDC. Anybody's got any ideas, please let me know. We'll let anybody on the committee know. Um, but we're working on your behalf, and we're having a lot of fun doing it. All right. All right. Well, it uh, was worth it. Uh, and I think you have a great slogan there. Uh, flood Brooklyn, uh, uh, and we're good to go. <laughs> um, okay, so um, any yes, yeah, so we have Katie for the, I guess maybe both the energy task force and sustainable, or maybe only anyway, Katie Frygang, I think for the sustainable CT program. <coughs> Um, I'm Katie Fragang, and to clarify, the Energy Task Force and the work of the Energy Task Force has been consumed by Sustainable CT, and Sustainable CT is now under the offices of the 
Conservation Commission. Katie, and the, I'm so sorry, but I really can't hear. Oh, I'll, I'll do it louder. And the, and the um, um, Conservation Commission has, uh, as you may have heard, Debbie Bennett, uh, myself, Pat Mulberry is our chair, uh, Marty Purnell, and Hector are uh, citizen um, people uh, on the committee. Anyway, uh, sustainable CT is a um, is a program that has been assembled by both the Sustainable Institute of Research Connecticut and the um, Conference of Municipalities to compile best practices in towns to give to it. It, it was compiled by civic leaders across the state to talk about issues in uh, normal civic departments and how they are solving their problems. So it's meant to be a huge resource for problem solving in towns. And as you know, uh, Connecticut is 75% towns under 25,000 people. So small towns is, is the <coughs> focus, although they're um, not starting their first as usual, but anyway. Um, so it, this, this process um, has uh, breaks down 10 categories, economics, natural resources, creative culture, planning, transportation, infrastructure, services, housing, equity, and then innovation. And um, that's what the blue lines are. Then, the interesting thing is this can also serve as a barometer for how well we're doing overall. Um, the darker things you see, the purple, green, and, and pink, are areas where we are already um, in dialogue with them and have uh, finished um, actions um, in those categories because that's actually part of the program is that they want you to try each section. The, the pink is, or this color, is where we are um, actively working. And the yellow is areas where we haven't, we have the potential for working on projects, but we are not working on projects. Um, the white are things that just don't apply to us. For instance, mass transportation. Um, what happens is that, so overall I'm presenting because I want different committees to drill down into this system and see what experience other towns can offer you and what resources they can offer you. And two examples, oh, and I'll tell you also, this board will be at Town Hall, and also I'm going to post it um, on the CCC website, so you'll be able to look at it specifically. Um, but to drill down into two examples, for instance, um, um, they have a whole section on placemaking. Placemaking is about creating identity in different areas of your town such that you can generate economic development. For instance, if we decided that we just, um, that Cornwall Bridge becomes the fishing center, and then we then advertise and start de um, developing PR, et cetera, to begin to create an identity so people know we go here for this. And, um, and they have a whole section on developing placemaking for economic development. So that's a key one. Um, let's, yeah, three? Okay, anyway, um, I'm done, I guess. I, I have another example, but nonetheless, um, I would really like to come to your um, committee and to help you go through these resources and see if it can help you. And um, that's what Sustainable CT is about. Thank and you. go to sustainablect.org for more information. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Is there anyone here from the Cornwall um, Housing Corporation? Who wants to speak? Here she comes. Okay. Make sure you whisper, Maggie, to pay everybody back. 
So I'm from the Cornwall Housing Corporation, which consists of uh, Jitty Block, um, Will Calhoun, Beth Frost, Katie Sandmeyer, Ward, um, Paul Crindle, Wade Wolf, Brigitte, Brigitte Geisler's, I think that's it. Um, the things that we brought up last time, two years ago, when we had this same kind of event, I, I thought maybe we were talking about what we wanted to see <coughs> in the town plan today rather than just where we were at. Close okay. both. Okay. Yes. So, okay. Well, we're, we're always looking for land. Um, the dogs are great, but people first. Anyway. Same five acres, <laughs> flat land. Um, but we can probably combine. Maybe we can make each new parcel program person take two pets. <laughs> <laughs> the last time, what we thought of, that what our board liked in particular from the recommendations from the 2010 town plan, which haven't yet been um, enacted, but are just sort of a continuing possibility, was the housing trust fund, in which pr private and public funds are earmarked for housing and stored for us. It would be up to the town to decide how they were used. Um, and we like the idea of a housing finance authority, particularly if it were configured as a subcommittee or a separate arm of the Cornwall Housing Corp or with a certain overlap of membership. Um, it seemed clever to us to have a distinct group dealing with the getting and giving function, but not a good idea to try and create a whole new bureaucratic entity with the same mandate. And we also talked about how the Housing Corporation and the Economic Development Commission can work, work together, um, you know, pinpointing many of the same uh, needs. And we've also talked with BART about even though our goals are seen as though they were completely divergent, um, there are actually ways in which we can work together. And actually he brought up <coughs> the first one, which is um, when they get the castle, we're going to make a lovely multi-family. <laughs> 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 Incentive housing zone. We, you know, Cornwall had a bad first experience with that, but if we found the perfect um, piece of land, it's a great possibility. And condominium development—that's a good one too. Um, oh, and then I have a lot of little, uh, incredibly geeky suggestions for twitches to the zoning regs, but not going to bore you Can now. Can you email those to yeah. us? I'll, I'd be glad to put them up, Matthew. I'll put them up on the website for okay. you. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, anyone here for Park and Rec? Um, I'm not sure Cornwall has a committee for seniors anymore. No, it, it should. Okay. Committee of the whole. How about anyone for the um, <coughs> West Cornwall um, Septic uh, Committee? We have a letter from Todd Piker that can be read into the record later oh. if you want. Because we've, um, we've got two or three letters that might happen. Do you want to, is anyone able to uh, um, summarize it or who's on the committee? 
Well, there's still, from my impressions, there's still, I'm working on it, and um, there's um, the big stumbling, are you going to, the big stum stumbling block is, blocks are where a community septic would be and who would pay for it. I mean, is that a fair um, summary? Pretty <laughs> fair. Um, so, um, I'll, I'll just add a couple things from Todd's uh, submission. Um, he's stating the mission statement adopted by the group to examine the current limitations of the water septic system in the village of West Cornwall, also to advise the Board of Selectmen and the town on practical improvement alternatives and the procedures to implement these possible alternatives. Um, goes on to say that um, they're focusing on the practical improvement phase of the above mission statement. They've interviewed and consulted with numerous engineers and finally selected the firm to fit the best, the, to fit our collective decision to craft a plan that addresses our unique geographical challenges. He names the members on the commission and um, just gives an overview. I will put his full statement up on the website with a lot of the other letters that we have. And while you're standing there, anything from the uh, uh, um, ZBA or anyone else? I'm going to speak for the ZBA. I'm the zoning enforcement officer, as you're very well aware. Um, I have brought this up with the ZBA. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a, actually the strongest board, land use board, because they have the power to amend or change the zoning regulations. And historically, to be on the ZBA, hardship is related to the land and very unsaid in many a land use uh, meeting and not the wheelchair. The handicap is, is supposed to, the hardship is the land and not the person who desperately might need something in a side yard or in a front yard to make their house more livable. That has progressed through for many, many years and it's really come to speak to my heart to the fact that the ZBA is obligated to make decisions that might not complement or be useful for people who want to live, who want to remain in Cornwall, who might have some access um, challenges to their home. You don't have to be white haired and have a Medicare card like I do. Um, you, can, you can be a young person that's been challenged by injuries from the Iraqi war, which are horrible traumatic injuries. There's young people being uh, influenced by diseases and I think that it is time that the town of Cornwall look at the, the Planning and Zoning Commission, look at regulations that would make it easier for ZBA not to be in the middle in which in the village, whether it's West Cornwall or downtown, in the village down in the village, it's to make housing more accessible to multi-generational type of, of situations, diseases and situations and so that a house that is retrofit for somebody to be able to live in a challenged situation becomes another house that is retrofit for other people to move to Cornwall. <coughs> That's a suggestion that the ZBA will be making to the Planning and Zoning Commission and the regulatory changes. Thank you. Um, anyone here from a group called Heal? How about the Housatonic um, River Commission? I'm here for the River Commission. They're 41 miles of Housatonic River from the Mass border down to Boardman Bridge in the Milford, and that's our that's our bailiwick. Uh, there are actually there's six six towns, two members from each town. Uh, I'm on the commission. Barton Jones is the junior representative. <laughs> <laughs> on the commission. I've been there a long time and it's not uncommon for people to actually die on the commission. <laughs> there are actually, actually seven towns um, in that 41 mile stretch but, stretch, but so far Sherman has decided not to participate. I think they were there originally. Um, just a side note, Gordon's father Bruce actually was one of the founding members of the River Commission. I think that's kind of interesting. We have a number of concerns. The first is, uh, is funding the committee, and it's funded presently by $350 from each of the member towns. And at the present time, that's been satisfactory. We hope it stays that way. 
Um, our main concern is looking at river impact from building projects, and we communicate directly with P and Z um, in respect of what our recommendation would be on those projects. They can follow our recommendations or not. Uh, ordinarily, we've got along very well with P and Z. Um, it turns out that that's our main concern, but our primary time is spent really on collateral issues. These are some of our concerns. First of all, river access. Um, we really don't have enough places to access the river. Uh, some of you may know, but the River Bend in West Cornwall has recently been renovated to be an improved access to the river, and that was an HVA project, and it was funded through monies which came from the GE EPA PCB settlement, <laughs> and there were $250,000 or so which went into that project out of, um, there were some, I think there were some seven and a half million dollars which came to Connecticut for river restoration and river projects as a result of the contamination by PCBs in the river. Uh, we're concerned about invasives. Two members of the River Commission canoed the entire 41 mile stretch and only Tom Zetterstrom could have this kind of zeal for this project. But, but they identified every invasive and invasive site along that 41 mile stretch. Am I correct on that, Barton? Yes. And um, we are obviously concerned about invasives, and um, we will come up with some kind of a management plan for invasives. Uh, PCBs, we continue to monitor PCBs. I'd like to read you a few words which come from Lynn Fowler, who is our representative to the ongoing, ongoing conferences which take place concerning the rest of the river, which has never been really resolved on what's going to happen with the, the, the remaining PCBs in the river. This is what she writes. I talked with her this morning, and she will stand by this. There is a Citizens Coordinating Council, which was formed at the time of the consent decree between GE and the EPA. Lynn is a member of that. That took place in 1999. It has been and continues to be a forum for the responsible parties, GE and EPA, and the stakeholder environmental groups to discuss remediation of the rest of the river. Now, we are not really in the rest of the river. The majority of the rest of the river is in Massachusetts. So what we have ended up with According to the EPA, there are around 3 million cubic yards of sediment in the rest of the river, and a lot of that, of course, is headed down here. Um, I'm really not paranoid about that. We, we do know what the levels are in Cornwall and the rest of the river. Um, you can't eat the fish. It obviously is a problem. Right now, the only thing we have going for us is that there, we are now on what's called monitored natural recovery and it's paid by GE. I don't know how often they actually monitor it, pretty often. We're also concerned about the wild and scenic. Where am I on time? Uh, it's at four minutes so far. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wild and scenic. We have a river coordinating committee which consists of HBA, Connecticut Deep, um, Northwest Hills, NPS, National Park Service, and HRC, and they meet with us. And last, I'd just like to say anything which impacts the river we're concerned about, the most recent item of concern is Cricket Valley Energy, which is down in Dover. Um, and I think that if you want to hear more about that, I'll tell you, but otherwise, I think I'm done. Except there, Kent School has purchased a major monitoring station to find out how much of that plant will, will come over in our direction and impact our air, degrade it, essentially. And, uh, and groups are being asked to to um, yeah. volunteer, vol volunteer money to add monitoring stations locally all around this six-town area. Thank you. Uh, anyone from, yes, I know uh, Jocelyn would like to speak for the uh, Northwest Hills Council of Government. Yes. Um, so the, the Council of Government serves 21 towns, uh, basically what you would think of as Litchfield County. We do community development work, economic development, and transportation planning. Um, we have a regional plan of conservation and development, which has um, really thought about you know, what are our goals regionally. Um, we really work with our towns to think of ways that we can share 
resources um, and solve uh, common challenges. As you know, um, a lot of us work in one town, live in another, go grocery shopping in another, um, and so we all kind of live our lives um, in, 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 the, in the region. Um, a couple of things we just wanted to mention um, in terms of transportation planning, um, we do administer over $8 million in grants for local road improvement. We also recently got a grant um, for something called the Rural Independent Transportation Service, or the RITS. <laughs> <laughs> and basically there are two minivans that are shared um, between the towns to help with folks who are elderly or disabled residents who need help getting to um, appointments uh, or other uh, um, other things that they need to get to and they can't and they can't drive themselves so we have some funding to do that um, we're also trying to solve some of our other transportation challenges um, we administer $300,000 in funding for emergency management issues um, and we have a public works cooperative so for example our small towns can um, share um, public works equipment um, uh, between towns so that not everybody has to have their own street sweeper for example so we kind of work on those sort of things that hopefully save our towns some money um, if they can share those resources with others. Um, I did want to mention again we, we got funding for um, pop-up hubs, uh, community hubs in three communities and one of them is going to be in West Cornwall so we're really excited about that. We hope it'll be really a community resource um, so that hopefully we'll have some co-working space for folks who maybe work at home now but would like to uh, work um, uh, with some other folks around and share a coffee maker. Or, um, and also a resource, uh, community resource for learning about what are the housing options, what are the transportation options um, in the town, and uh, an idea, we'll have an ideas billboard so people can continue to give us their ideas about how we attract young people, how do we solve transportation uh, challenges, how do we work better with each other um, together. Um, we also have a regional economic development plan uh, one of the things that was mentioned a couple times today is fiber optic broadband. Um, we have a real plan for addressing that in Cornwall and our surrounding communities. Um, and so um, between that and a few other initiatives, if you want to know more about them, you can let us know or, or visit our website. We have a big economic development summit happening next Tuesday night where we'll start rolling out our plan for how we're going to build out the fiber um, in our communities um, and increase economic opportunities. So um, if you have any questions about that, let me know or visit our website. It's all there. Um, and that's it. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, piggyback very slightly on that fiber optic because Jocelyn just uh, told me in the past week like, I don't know how, how up on the importance of that everyone in this room is. If everyone is as slow to be up on it as I am, uh, perhaps, perhaps you're thinking, that who knows why we need it. But um, Jocelyn just told me, and it, I've been hearing kind of rumors of this, that in the not too distant future, a lot of our medical care is going to come through fiber optic into our homes. In the uh, not too far off in the future, homes that don't have fiber optic are going to be harder to sell. Um, right now, uh, uh, businesses are doing a, a lot of their work in the cloud. This requires fiber optic. So those are like three reasons I didn't really um, know about that I'm sharing. Um, anyone here for Park and Rec? Who want to speak? Okay. Now is there any group I have left off who is, um, is ready to speak? Uh, I see some hands in back. I'll get to you, Richard. I mean, the um, 
from the uh, town commission? Yes. Any group working in Cornwall that hasn't spoken yet? So. Yes, the library. Well, here. Um, I'm Betsy Morrow, a proud Cornwall resident, resident in my uh, Cornwall wardrobe. I'm also executive director of Women's Support Services, and we are an agency that seeks to create communities free of domestic violence through intervention, prevention, and education. I'll just address two things. Um, as executive director, how uh, Women's Support Services intersects with Cornwall. Um, we serve the towns of Region 1, including some border towns in New York and Massachusetts. We do respond to people who are in crisis because of inter, um, intimate partner violence. And so we often uh, bring people into shelter who need housing beyond shelter. So what we find in our work is when we're working with, with uh, people who are fleeing domestic violence to create a new home, uh, we look for housing opportunities where they can be safe and can start a new life. So all the initiatives you're talking about with affordable housing, uh, we look for places where we can relocate people. So I would just uh, bring that to your attention. Also intersecting with uh, Cornwall's future plans, uh, we have gone, because we have a prevention and uh, peace, we do a lot of education work in Region 1 schools. In the last 18 months, we have gone from 40 presentations per year to 340 presentations wow. per year. We are in every single school in Region 1 working with uh, students so that they can uh, create skills around boundary setting, how to have a healthy life, to, to um, increase their abilities as adults to be fulfilled, safe, healthy individuals. Um, so we work from daycares through uh, 12th grade. And um, because the schools have some requirements to bring some of the types of programming we do into the school, I wanted to let you know that we go in and all of our services are free. So the schools then fulfill some of their state requirements at no cost to the town because Women's Support Services can go in and form that partnership. We're incredibly proud of the partnerships we have with all the schools in Region 1 also some of our private schools as well but uh, i want to thank you for your partnership your support i could tell you a lot more but i want to be under that limit <laughs> and, uh, well, thank you, you thank are. you so much yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah that was that was a, a two and a half minute um uh, now someone else before okay nikki Good morning, uh, Reverend Mickey Nunmiller from the United Church of Christ. Uh, I want to thank the Planning and Zoning for inviting uh, nonprofits, but this year for the first time, any churches who wanted to contribute to the discussion. Thank you very much. So, just quickly to mention, uh, for those who might not know, our mission is to offer spiritual resources of a progressive nature uh, to those who are seeking them and to promote justice and care for those in need or who may be marginalized, and to offer opportunities for those who want to serve others uh, who need a community through which to do that, who may not be members of our church or who may not have any particular belief system. So that's what we're here for. And I, I want to uh, suggest to Community Resources Committee that you add spiritual resources to your list of what's needed to bring people to town. And I realize. Uh, Churches are shrinking because fewer people are interested in religious things, but uh, it doesn't mean everyone's not interested. So having a spiritual resource in a town, very important. So, uh, so for us, as far as what we need for the future, we need people. <laughs> and uh, I think it more or less has all been stated uh, about housing. And you know, from our perspective, we need people to exist as a, an organization. Uh, but we also have the perspective of caring for those who uh, may need housing here who can't afford it. So we're interested in affordable housing. We're interested in making sure the town maintains a social worker who can do things we cannot do. And also, uh, we're proud to house the town food pantry in our space as part of our mission. So I think I'm under three. <laughs> 
I'm going to uh, put your prepared statement up on the website. Oh, great. thank you very much for that. That was even under two. <laughs> okay, so um, I hear. I'm Connie Manis. I uh, work for the Housatonic Valley Association, which, as you heard, has its main office in Cornwall. Uh, I actually, I, I work there for um, its Green Print Collaborative, which is a regional project that aligns loosely with the Northwest Hills COG. There are a few more towns around the sides that are involved in that. Um, I live in Kent, and I'm raising a family there, so many of these concerns about the vitality of our river towns and the opportunities for young families and for people to stay in our towns uh, ring true to me. Um, since, I think, the fall of 2017, when the COG came out with its regional POCD, um, I have been increasingly interested in how conservation and development complement each other and how they interrelate. Uh, and I think that it's true, and definitely today from what I've heard, it's really impossible to divorce Cornwell from natural resources. It's just a part of who we are. I mean, Cornwall is all about its rural and clean, natural feeling. We're not um, an urban flatlands. Uh, we're about the Housatonic and the mountains and our farms and our heritage of farming. Um, today, specifically, so, so I guess, you know, for me, it's more about how conservation and development work together to complement each other. A, a, a very easy example is how you build in places for groundwater recharge when you develop a parking lot to prevent flooding. Right? Um, today, specifically, I came to present a map <laughs> and introduce a concept, hopefully will be helpful for your POCD. It's called Follow the Forest, uh, and I'll leave it with you. Um, it's regional, and actually it's a multi-state effort that stretches now from the Chesapeake to Canada. Uh, and uh, this map uses geospatial data and modeling to show where there are core areas of forest. <laughs> Sorry, should have put that on the board. Um, and where there are areas that connect those. And why that's important is that these are places where animals can continue to move from south to north, uh, particularly as our climate changes. And they happen to correlate very well with clean water and carbon recharge, which means clean air and recreational opportunities and all of that. So two takeaways for us in Cornwall today. Uh, right now in Cornwall, there are a lot of corridors still, a lot of different possibilities for animals to move from south to north. And that's really nice. But when you take a look at what's happened in like, when I did this in Watertown, there weren't very many. So this is a planning map because things change and as things <coughs> build, you're going to see that, you know, it, it's almost like playing a video game. Uh, your opportunities are going to change and you're going to want to keep an eye on that. Um, and then the second thing is that it doesn't really place an absolute on what should happen. I'm a conservation person, but keeping a corridor open can mean permanently protecting the property, but it can also mean working with whoever owns the property to just make sure that it is open and appropriately managed. And so it really kind of envisions a lot of different ways that you can work with land just to make things better for all of us, certainly for animals, but you know, the impact is that you know, we all increase our wellness and our economic vitality. Um, I realize that this map only addresses one half of the well, equation. This is what I do in the work week. On the weekends, I would call my map in, I don't have a catchy title, but I would call it Shop, Exercise, Eat, Meet Up, and Smile. Uh, Jocelyn knows that we work to map all of the trails in the region. I think a companion map might show in Cornwall where there are trails, walkways, paths, green spaces, and access, including parking on and off of trails, places where people of um, different abilities and different localities um, might use trails. I'm talking about strollers, bikes, dogs, wheelchairs, roller blades, skateboards, Almost kayaks, right. and canoes. So I'm sure you can envision that, and I hope that that might be helpful for your POC data.
Thank you. I, I would like to add for the record that um, my cohort at HBA, Mike Jastrzemski, submitted a very long report uh, defining many of his projects with mapping. I think it's about 25 pages. That will go up on the website in total. <laughs> 30 seconds. <laughs> Any other groups? Oh, Lisa. Okay. I'm the president of the board of the Cornwall Historical Society. You might not think that has much to do with the future, but <laughs> let me tell you. Um, we're looking to expand our role beyond the walls of that little place in Cornwall Village. We just think there's so much more out there. You want the castle? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no more property for us, thank you very much. Um, but we have learned from the work done by the committees in this planning and zoning board about some, what some of the issues are that really seem to indicate Cornwall is moving into a period of change. We want to be able to document that, to make sure that what we collectively and individually understand about it gets into the record at the Cornwall Historical Society. But we also want to engage the town in the work that we're doing. Um, for instance, we want to talk to townspeople about what matters to them. For example, what should the Historical Society be collecting now that will explain the last 50 years, approximately, of Cornwall's life, and what should it collect in the future? This is a real conundrum for a lot of organizations like ours. And unless we move into that with some sense of definition and purpose, then we become Granny's Attic, which isn't really appropriate. Um, but anyway, moving outside the walls could mean we can dig in the ground to look for the archaeological record. I know the um, Institute of Indian Affairs in Washington is inter in, interested in poking around to look for traces of native peoples in Cornwall. Um, we also can get a good look at our historic homes and the landscapes. I was very interested to see that the Conservation Commission is looking into the historic landscapes too, which is of great interest to us nowadays. But, you know, it's a curious question, like how did Cornwall settlers in 1740 decide how to build their lives in this remote corner of the world. I mean, what made them even think if you bought your 40 acres and a mule into Cornwall in 1740, what your future was, was going to be? Um, anyway, we are looking forward to the next 10 years and to making our role strong in Cornwall too. Thank you. Thank you. And back there. Thanks. Oh. I'm Carla Herman. I'm the vice president of the tour service, and I'll tell you quickly what that is, so you know why I'm here and why I thought I had to take up another minute of your time. Uh, we provide services. I, this, I probably have the dubious distinction of representing the least sexy group. <laughs> so, services for seniors. Um, we, at any one given point in time, are in the homes of about 20 people in Cornwall, helping them to be able to stay in home. Louder? Wow. So, I'm sorry. Um, so we provide services to seniors, non-medical services, so they can stay in their homes. And the importance is that then they can be well, be at home, not move out, have to, have to move out of the community into supported housing. Their houses are kept tidy, their yards are kept tiny, tidy, so we don't end up with eyesores of people who aren't able to keep up with their properties alone. And then finally, at any given time, we employ probably six to eight people from Cornwall to do the service. 
And that leads to the final piece that's most relevant to today, um, that we, um, we also look at uh, affordable housing is very, very important to be able to employ the people who earn more than minimum wage that they might get from a nursing service organization um, and can take care of the residents. So I uh, thank you. I know um, Cornwall's always been very supportive of us. We serve several counties. And we have a one-page summary on mine. Uh, I have your one-page summary, and thank you very much. Thank it's you. going up on the website. Thank you. keep coming up. <laughs> okay. For those who do not know me, my name is Diane Beebe and I'm the Emergency Management Director now for the Town of Cornwall. A uh, strange thing has happened since taking on that role. I find my sleep patterns to be slightly disrupted. <laughs> uh, sadly, after the tragedy in California um, and the uh, destruction of the towns there, I started driving around Cornwall looking at what our roads are like, what our forested areas are like, where our homes are sitting. What I ask is that for each of the commissions that are working, and we look to be building, and we look to be conserving, that we also keep in mind a sense of safety, that we look at what evacuation routes might be, how are we positioned. Um, I'm not asking folks run right out and start raking our woods, but <laughs> we, do need, we do need to be thinking about um, what our conditions are like. For each of the groups that spoke today, as I was listening, I wasn't hearing one key component, and I do want to think about safety. As you go back and you are talking within your committees, think about the safety aspect of what we're doing. Um, when we are bringing in people, how we are doing that. Uh, you raised, a, a Karen, thank you for the point on homes and the accessibility <coughs> of a home. Our town also needs to be accessible and our town also needs to be safe. Like any other organization, this is volunteer. We have, many of you might remember, the very old, old days of civil preparedness and the groups that used to be around. We have now the Civilian Emergency Response Team, CERT. If you're not part of CERT and you'd like to be uh, part of that in the future, uh, supporting this town, please let me know. Um, and again, as you do your committees and you would like uh, some input, I would be more than happy to spend some time with each of you. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else? Two more hands. Okay, well, just keep coming. <laughs> Sorry. Isn't Cornwall a fantastic place? <laughs> it is, and one of the reasons it's so fantastic is that we've really got a very good library. <laughs> I may remember that Einstein once famously said that all you really need in life to get on is the address of the library. <laughs> on behalf of the library, I'd like to say you also need a reader's card. <laughs> um, I'm Simon Hewitt, President of the Library, uh, and I think you know, the basic message is that the library is thriving. Um, as you all know, all libraries, all public libraries around the country are facing a very difficult environment at the moment, particularly as technology changes. Um, I think we're adapting fairly well, but it's a continual challenge to make the library useful and relevant. Um, I think one thing about the library at the moment is that we are effectively the social center of town. Um, we've got a very active uh, variety of programs, services, and events. I don't know who went last night, but we actually had a Robert Burns evening, evening last night, which was a trial run. Uh, that'll be more elaborate uh, next year. Um, <laughs> the library also now has both solar power and a generator. Uh, so we can actually be a heating and cooling center in the event for sustained uh, power outage. Um, a key goal we've got at the library is to try and extend the appeal of the library, um, both to current users of the library, but also to people who aren't using the library at the moment. And there's a, uh, a reasonable sized group of people who are not using it, so we're shortly going to be sending out a survey uh, asking people what they like about the library, what they don't like about the library, what services they would like to see, and what additional activities they would like us uh, to offer. Um, 
I think it's uh, true to say, for those of you who tried to do it, our meeting room is uh, increasingly in use. Uh, yeah. And as some of you who came to the macular degeneration event last week, you will probably also have noticed that our meeting room is increasingly full. Um, so I think one of the things we're going to need over time is probably more space at the library, uh, both for meetings uh, and for storage. And then, of course, like everyone else in this town, we would also benefit uh, from high-speed data and improved cellular service. Um, cell, cell service really is critical because people need to be reached. Uh, and if they're going to come to the library and find they can't be reached by telephone, that's a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Years, I would like to beat the shortest presentation time set the clock. I am a volunteer trustee on the Greenwoods Counseling Referrals Board. It's a service that provides mental health services, one of those quiet, necessary needs in Northwest Connecticut. We are woefully inadequately covered by mental health services in this area. And so what Greenwoods centered over in Litchfield is, is a call to, uh, or, a, or an email to, uh, GreenwoodsReferrals.org. A counselor takes the information. Someone is stressed for whatever reasons, from, from opioid addictions and alcohol to uh, economic stress. And within two days, they'll receive a free uh, referral. They'll, they'll talk with a qualified counselor and get three referrals to private practitioners to match their need, determined by the professional they talk with. So it's an, it's an open door for people with mental health services. Very quiet, it's been supported by the Cornwall Foundation, and some of the towns also support this service, and all the money is raised privately. It's quiet, it's necessary, greenwoodsreferrals.org, anywhere you can call and get some help. Thank you. I think that was, uh, that was a record. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, I'll Richard, I'll let, I'll I would just like to um, let people know that the website, I know we don't, I'm the only representative from the website committee here, but we're revamping our website within another th three months, by, at least by April, there'll be a new Cornwall website, and it'll, hopefully it will be easier to use. I prefer the original Cornwall website because it's very simple, but we'll, uh, we'll ask questions if people prefer the new or the old when it comes out in around April. Thank you. Well, thank you. And the website has been s indispensable for us. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's one of the great things that came out of uh, Cornwall Charette, I think. Mm -hmm. I, don't if, I don't know if anyone was here for that Cornwall Charette that happened 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe the website came out of that. Yeah, and CCM too. And what? The, the Cornwall Community Network. Yeah, so it's also. really, it's a, that was a great event. Um, anyone else? Okay. I'll be the last one. Uh, well, Paul. Yes. I, I'm the president of the Cornwall Chronicle, and I just want to say we're still here. Everyone's talking about the death of local journalism. The way people are going strong, but we need you. We need writers, we need editors. And remember to communicate with us about all these things I'm hearing today. I've heard a lot of things I didn't know about. Please talk to us. We need we need input from you. It doesn't just happen automatically. We need people to help. Thanks. Um, Oh, absolutely. Uh, my name is Gary Steinkolt. My husband and I are one of the newbies. We've been here four years. And on the going forward mode, um, we're very excited to be part of the Cornwall Association. We are the ones creating the April 26th trivia night at the library. Mark your calendars. It's going to be fun. Um, we did think of, and this is obviously a newbie's realization, you don't really know much. We thought of asking the question, who is the longest serving selectman in Cornwall? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we heard. <laughs> so we're not asking. But if you do know that answer, you will get a point. And that night, we promise it will be a blast. It's also going to be a fundraiser for the library. So please, Mark. <laughs> is that fast? Very yes. good. Oh no, the, the, the dumber you are. Very good. Um, I'm Gordon. Yeah, I didn't want to answer that question, but 
I did have a quick other presentation in my other capacity as a member of the fire department to say it's, it's not just a theoretical problem. We probably have, uh, we're down about 20% first responders on the ground in the last five years. So anyone here that is um, able to uh, come to this meeting could find a role for themselves in the fire department. And I would like to just give a tip of the hat to Peter Thomas, who is still an active member, being a fire policeman at age 80. Uh, so that tells you what some people are able to step up to do. So I would like to end the meeting as we started with a tip of the hat. I'm Thank you. I'm afraid it isn't quite the end. But it's not but the end today. But that's, uh, so there's plenty of things But to do that's a very appropriate uh, reminder about Peter. Not yet. Um, <laughs> Phil wanted to ask, is there anyone here uh, on behalf of the Cornwall Foundation uh, prepared to speak? I'm here, but we are a responsive organization that supplies small grants to the local, a non-profit and civic organizations of Cornwall and those who Cornwall's residents use for their short-term or one-off needs. And so apply to us, but we think you're all doing great work, and that's it. Anyone else? You're going once? Going twice? Karen! I'd like to do a little bit of wrap-up. As you know, I have a few hats on land use administrators, so I get to coordinate three, three land use commissions. I spoke for ZBA. I want to quickly speak for wetlands because something came up in talking about emergency services. The Wetlands Commission cannot change their regulations because they're mandated by the state of Connecticut to protect wetlands and watercourses while allowing reasonable development. A lot of people forget that part. That is part of the statute. You are fortunate to have a local commission that looks at um, agriculture as something that should be encouraged in terms of uh, easy and quick permitting. It's as of right. We have updated the regulations to 2011. The one thing that we have not updated our regulations to is fire protection. There's been some issues over the state in terms of making sure the town's fire departments can get um, fire ponds and hydrants in. Now that's as of right, that will be amended into the regulations and my office encourages people to come in and make sure that if you have some sort of fire protection entity on your property that you can keep it open and maintained for the fire department. The most recent piece is that as a Nash pond is being dredged and redone, there will be another dry hydrant as part of that plan. The property owner was very gracious in doing that. So I wanted to speak to the emergency management piece that the Wetlands Commission is also very aware of that. The Wetlands Commission also takes a uh, very um, proactive stand on septic systems and wells. They're as of right. You do not have to come to Cornwall and spend a lot of money with an engineer that has to go to two or three meetings. We look at that as protective of wetlands to have uh, performing septic systems of any size. The regulated area can be used for septic. And in the past three weeks, I've had two folks come in that needed wells. They had no water. And without a meeting, we got uh, those those applications, those petitions for declaratory rulings move forward so that a woman up on Flat Rocks Road did have water. And I was told by the contractor that our process saved over $800 because that person did not have to come to wetlands meetings and spend a lot of time proving the point that people are entitled to drinking water. So that's one other piece. I also want to speak, I want to give Gordon Ridgeway a lot of credit. In 2013, we started this planning meeting. It started off with four commissions. He's in my office all the time since 2013 to expand this meeting to churches and to all the people that were in the um, original plan. Jenny Potter got the word out to all of you. We've, we were trying to expand our database, and I would encourage that anybody that put input in, please put it in writing. Please get it to the CW land use at optonline.net, opt -online and it will be up on the website, it'll also be incorporated as part of the new town plan. And my final word is, I don't live in Cornwall. I live in New Hartford. I can't move my 60-foot Don Redwood tree that my dad planted years ago for my daughter. Otherwise, I would live in Cornwall. It is a great place to live. This, this commission, um, trying to make Cornwall a better place to live, is to be commended. I don't think anybody in this room realizes how much work 
the folks on this commission have been doing in the past year or so to put things on like this to open the door for input and Jocelyn Ayer, also the Northwest Hills COG, Jocelyn, Ricklin, everybody at the COG that has been so helpful in promoting this, surveys and whatever, you are all to be commended and I personally applaud you for the work you do. You need... I do want to open the, the floor for some questions. And the, I know uh, it's been long and it's, uh, we're approaching noon. The process will be is that we'll see if there are any urgent questions. But then we're going to break and there's the, the, the boards that are in back to, to add your uh, input to and there's food. You can ask us questions in that time too. And then we're going to have a very brief, brief, different meeting after that. Um, but are there any urgent of questions that people would like to bring forth at this moment? Okay. Can I hear a motion then to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? <laughs> okay. Wow. Look at that. Boy, we're always giving each other. <laughs> <laughs>